Good morning, I'm Dr. Alexander Halleck. I'm the Associate Chief of Staff of Education for VA Eastern Kansas. I'm also the one that uh, teaches and coordinates the uh, Eastern Kansas Decontamination Response Team. And today what we're gonna be talking about real quick is the personal protective equipment that is uh, re highly recommended and in Eastern Kansas required for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, strain COVID-19 that appeared last fall uh, in uh, Wuhan, China. Basically what COVID-19 is, it's a severe acute respiratory syndrome uh, coronavirus. Uh, it also is known as the COVID-2 uh, as there are a number of different strains of coronavirus and each of them has their own uh, sub-designation, and this one has been termed uh, COVID-19. It's a virus with a genetic similarity to a lot of the coronaviruses that are found in bats. Now, there are a number of different coronaviruses that can cause uh, uh, infections in humans, everything ranging from the common cold all the way up to uh, MERS-CoV, which was uh, first characterized in the Middle East, hence the designation. After uh, perhaps rhinovirus, coronaviruses are the second uh, largest number of um, viruses that can cause what we consider the common cold. This particular strain is a brand new one that the human population has never seen, and so there's not a lot of data out on it right now as to what the penetration is, what the actual mortality is. We're kind of learning new things about it as we go along. What the WHO did um, a couple of days ago was categorize COVID-19 as a pandemic. Essentially, a pandemic is any kind of an epidemic that occurs on a scale that crosses international borders, usually affecting a large number of people. Not an epidemic, it's just the rapid spread of an infectious agent, large number of people in a given population over a short period of time, usually about two weeks. There are really only two pandemics right now that the WHO has classified, and the other one is the HIV pandemic, which they still consider the world to be in the middle of. Uh, transmission of COVID-19, um, and by the way, if you can't read these slides or want to try and memorize them, they're going to be up on TMS here pretty soon, so you're going to have something to refer to. And I know that a couple of the nurse managers and supervisors in the other areas have taken the slides and have put them into their particular areas, so it will be available to you. Earlier reports, um, and subsequent reports have confirmed that person-to-person -person transmission most commonly happens during close exposure to a person with COVID-19, primarily via respiratory droplets produced when the infected person either coughs or sneezes. Droplets can land in the mouth, the nose, and the eyes of people when they are nearby and possibly inhaled into the lungs of those in close proximity. We are very familiar with the mouth and the nose, but we tend to forget the eyes with the blood vessels that are very close Eyes are a very important uh, site of potential uh, exposure to something. In chemical decontamination, one of the big four areas we worry about, in addition to the skin, the lungs, and the GI tract, is we worry about the eyes. The most common part of injury in World War I, secondary to a chemical agent, was in the eyes, usually from, from mustard agent. Now, that would make a little bit of sense in that when you're in a trench, the first thing you're looking over the edge of it is with your eyes, but it was very, it was um, actually, mouth would be exposed too, but the eyes seem to take the biggest hit. And that's the same thing with a lot of respiratory pathogens. The eyes are a route of entry. The contribution of small particles called aerosols or drop of nuclei to close proximity transmission is currently uncertain. However, we do seem to think that long, uh, long distance transmission between person to person is unlikely, that there is a sort of a a sweet spot where you need to be beyond that particular person, uh, whereas your transmission gets um, uh, drops off. Procedures then, the PPE procedures are then used to mitigate these particular entry sites. Close contact can occur, according to the CDC, while caring for patients, including being within approximately six feet, again, that seems to be the sweet zone, of a patient with COVID-19 for a prolonged period of time. Now, what exactly is a prolonged period of time? CDC even admits they're not quite sure what that actually means. The best way I can, I can think about it is if you think about radiation exposure, time distance shielding. The less time you're exposed to the patient, the farther away you are from the patient, and the more things that are in between you and the patient, your likelihood of getting an infection from COVID-19 drops off dramatically. Or we'd have direct contact with infectious secretions from a patient with COVID-19. They may include the sputum, serum, blood, respiratory droplets. 
So if close contact occurs with a patient with COVID-19 and the healthcare personnel does not have the recommended PPE on, they may be at much higher risk of infection. So who needs the PPE for people that present to our hospital? Number one, the patient themselves with either confirmed or possible COVID-19 is going to be in a surgical mask or a face mask while they're being evaluated medically. That is if they cough or they sneeze, it is theoretically going to be caught by the face mask that they're wearing. Us, we need to be in both standard contact and airborne PPE or personal protective equipment required uh, again, it's required in Eastern Kansas, strongly recommended by the CDC. These precautions include some form of respirator, starting with a NIOSH approved N95 respirator, obviously gowns, gloves, face shield, and eye protection. The best way I can think about this and put it in terms of things we have all seen before is, think about a patient with active tuberculosis that's in Clostridioides difficile contact isolation who might spit in your face. That's probably the best way to think about um, these kinds of patients and put it into the context of something that we have pretty much already seen in uh, clinical practice. What is a respirator? A respirator is just a personal protective device that's worn over the face, covers at least the nose and mouth, and is used to reduce the wearer's risk of inhaling some sort of hazardous particle. The dust particle, uh, as if you worked in a factory or at home when you, you, you saw wood quite a bit, infectious agents, gases, or vapors, so this could be used in a chemical plant uh, for whatever reason. The point of a respirator is that all the air that reaches your lungs has been filtered through some sort of an apparatus, and that is the only way that it has received, reached, your, reached your lungs. All respirators that are used are required by OSHA um, to be NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, to be NIOSH certified, especially those that are intended for use in healthcare. If it's not been certified, then you can't trust that the respirator that you're using is actually something that's going to protect you. Now the types of respirators that are out there sort of in a general context, you can see you have those that supply air, whether it's a self-contained breathing apparatus or an airline, we are obviously not going to be doing this. We are not firefighters. We are not doing level A decontamination response. We're going to be using a combination of one or of two air purifying respirators. The first one is the N95 mask. Um, and for those who are either not able to use the N95 mask, we will be using some form of a PAPR, a positive uh, air purifying respirator, which I'm going to talk about here in a, little, in a bit. We're not going to be using half face or full face uh, respirators or anything like that. So what is an N95 respirator? Basically, an N95 respirator, the N stands for a mask that is not oil resistant. We don't work in an area or a or circumstances where we are going to be uh, exposed to oil products like we would in say a factory that, that would produce them. The N95 just basically means that about 95% of the airborne particles less than 0.3 microns in size are going to be filtered through the mask. You can go up to N99 and N100 which is about 99.97%. Traditionally, the N95 is the one that's been used in healthcare. Again, we don't need oil resistant masks. Would it be better to have some of the higher mask uh, um, filtering capabilities? Yes, there's a potential possibility that we may receive them, but in healthcare, traditionally, the one we have all used has been the N95 mask, and that has been deemed to be the one that provides us with an adequate amount of safety. Whether or not we go to these other ones, will be guided by either supplies or by what the CDC, VA, uh, World Health Organization deems we have to go to. So, your N95 mask or higher level respirator is what's recommended for healthcare personnel who've been medically cleared, trained, and fit tested in the context of a facility's respiratory protection program. Now, OSHA requires each facility, whether it's a chemical plant, a hospital that uses respirators of any size, shape, or form, you have to have a program that records the people that are getting, um, that are going to be going into respirators, that you make sure they're medically cleared, and that you maintain these over time. So what also needs to happen is if you, um, you also need to understand what the safe removal, disposal, and medical contraindications to a respirator are. In other words, if you're going to be getting in one of those, or rather wearing one of those, you have to understand how to put it on, how to take care of it, how to dispose of it, and what are the contraindications of you potentially putting on one of those. Or, 
as part of our respirator program, us determining whether or not it is safe for you to put one of those on. So what's the difference between the surgical mask or just the face mask and the N95 respirator? Well, surgical masks have got to be cleared through the FDA, but the N95 respirator has specific requirements uh, through OSHA that it, uh, for its evaluation, its testing, and its approval. And then NIOSH will then certify that that N95 mask has met all the requirements to be essentially an N95 mask. So the intended use and purpose, this is essentially for those large droplets, splashes, sprays, or other things. The N95 is designed to reduce the wearer's exposure to particles, and those particles of at least 0.3 micron um, or larger. The surgical mask is obviously loose fitting. There needs to be a tight fitting uh, and fit tested requirement with the N95 respirator. Um, we do have to do a seal check requirement and it's required each time the respirator is done. The reason being is that if you do not get a good seal around that mask, the edges of the mask, you are going to get air in and then the point of having a respirator is completely negated. So the filtration, we talked about the 95% of airborne particles and the size, leakage. When an N95 respirator is properly fit and donned, there will be minimal to no leakage around the edge of the respirator when the user inhales. So the advantages, they're readily available. I say usually readily available. They have no interference with the use of a stethoscope, which is important in healthcare. They're not powered and they're noiseless, so there's nothing in there to interfere with you being able to hear appropriately. The disadvantages, as we mentioned, they do require fit testing. They do leave part of the face and neck exposed to droplets. It does increase the work of breathing. They can be uncomfortable because you are basically generating air via negative pressure that's being pulled in through the face mask. And the idea being is that air is then filtered by the N95 mask. But the longer you're in that, that does require a little bit more work to breathe. And the longer that you're in it, you may find yourself wearing out a little bit quicker than you thought. One of the reasons why medical clearance is important for putting on an N95 face mask. They're not generally really usable, although the CDC is saying that if you need to uh, keep it through the end of the shift, um, that's appropriate and we are working on our own little mechanism for uh, where do we keep the mask after you've left the patient's room? Do you put it into a paper sack with your name on it? We don't want to put it into a plastic sack because coronaviruses are known to stick to plastic. So we're sort of working on the parameters of how to do that. Um, and it can't be used for employees with beards or anything else that's going to prevent a tight seal along the face. So March 11th, the CDC did update their guidelines uh, for N95 use. Basically what they stated was based on whatever the situational analysis in your area is. In other words, how, what is your stock of N95 masks and what is the likelihood of you being able to get any more? If you have to actually use it, you can use a surgical mask if necessary. And then whatever N95 masks you have, you save those for um, those procedures that are likely to generate a respiratory aerosol. In other words, the highest risk of exposure. Best example I can come up with is if we have to go in and do a bronchoscopy on a patient, we are not want to use we are not going to want to use surgical masks during that time frame because that is a higher risk procedure. Much more likelihood that aerosols that could be infected with COVID-19 would then get into the air. So face masks will protect the wearer from some sort of splashes and sprays, um, and then again the respirator is the one that gives you the uh, uh, respiratory protection. When your supply chain is restored and when you know that you have enough N95 masks available, you need to go back to using an N95 mask for any uh, patients with known or suspected COVID-19. Um, those facilities who do not currently have a respirator uh, protection program need to develop one per OSHA and per the CDC. So you now have a way of tracking those employees that you are putting into a respirator so if there's any problems afterwards, you can, you can watch that, but that you are medically clearing the patients or rather the employees that are going into a respirator. So the guidelines also say we recommend, strongly recommend eye protection gowns and gloves. If there are shortages on gowns, it's the same sort of thing. Save the gowns for those people that are going to actually need them with the higher risk. Those aerosol generating procedures, splashes and sprays are anticipated. Hand hygiene, should, uh, healthcare personnel should perform hand hygiene before and after all patient contact. 
with a potentially infectious material before putting on and after removing PPE, including the gloves. And we'll go through sort of a protocol that the University of Nebraska's uh, biocontainment unit has come up with, which sort of mirrors what the CDC already has, but they had some very good pictures, um, and it's something we didn't have to actually recreate on our own. Um, hand hygiene after removing the PPE is particularly important because anything that's on your hands may have been transferred. That's the area of your body that's most likely to have uh, COVID-19 on it. Hand hygiene should be performed with an alcohol-based hand rub, preferably at about 60 to 95% alcohol concentration, or you can wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 minutes. Again, if your hands are visibly soiled, blood, vomit, something else on them, you need to clean them first with soap and water and then proceed with an alcohol-based hand rub. Eye protection, very important. You wanna put on your eye protection. Uh, it can be goggles, it can be disposable face shield. It covers the front and the sides of the face upon entry to the patient room or care area. Personal eyeglasses, contact lenses are not considered the appropriate adequate eye protection for COVID-19. You wanna remove the eye protection before leaving the patient room or care area. And again, the reusable eye protection, if you're gonna be going with that, they need to be cleaned uh, and disinfected in between each patient use. You do not wanna to continue to keep using those. And again, if it's disposable, you get rid of it. Gloves, non-sterile, clean, sterile gloves going into the patient's room or care area. You, if they become torn, heavily contaminated, you need to change them immediately. Remove and discard any gloves after leaving the patient room care area and immediately perform hand hygiene after you have removed your gloves. Gowns, again, clean isolation gown upon entry to the patient room or area. Change the gown if it becomes soiled. Discard it and remove it after leaving the room. If we are using cloth gowns or any kind of reusable gown, there will be a mechanism for keeping that gown uh, isolated until it can be cleaned. We, don't, we clean them after every patient use. As mentioned before with the N95 masks and with the gowns, if you have a shortage of the gowns, save those for those procedures or circumstances where there's a higher likelihood of virus transmission. Obviously, those aerosol-generated procedures, care activities where splashes and sprays are anticipated, and high contact patient care activities that provide an opportunity for transfer of the COVID pathogen to the hands and clothes of the healthcare personnel, such as dressing, doing, uh, uh, providing hygiene to a patient, bathing, assisting with toileting, changing linens, device care, wound care. Our patients in the uh, CLC, those patients that we might have in the intensive care unit that are unable to move themselves, circumstances like that. All right, so at the end of it all, here's what the super suit should basically look like. You should have some sort of eye protection, you should have an NIOSH approved uh, N95 respirator at the or greater, you should have a gown on, and you should have gloves on. No, we don't have head covering, although for those of you who might have long hair or something like that, you might want to wear head covering to keep your hair covered, um, unless you have it back in a ponytail and you, or maybe tucked in the back of the gown, but it is not required. Foot coverings are not required in this either, unless you're gonna be going into something where you feel like the feet might be exposed to something else. For example, there's a vomit on the floor, there's blood on the floor, or something like that. I joke that if those are on the floor, then something, something went awry with the patient. But it's not actually required. You don't need to disinfect your shoes afterwards. Again, if you walk through something potentially, or you feel like you might, then shoe coverings may be something that you wanna consider putting on. They will be available if necessary. All right, so the basic procedures for donning your PPE. The first one, again, very busy slide. It will be up on TMS. But the first thing you do is you sterilize your hands, either with an alcohol-based hand rub or with uh, soap and water before you proceed with anything. Next step is to don the gown. Um, again, through the sleeves, it's not necessary to uh, put on two gowns, one on the back, one on the front. Check the gown before you put it on because, again, any personal protective equipment that you put on, you want to make sure that it is going to protect you because you are the one that is wearing it when you're in the room. Make sure that you uh, tie all the ties with uh, bows that are easy to take off. Uh, I know after doing the procedure, it's very cathartic to want to rip off that gown afterwards, but there are a reason why um, PPE recommendations are in place and they are to protect us so that our chances of getting something have been diminished. Don in the N95 respirator, this is just a really good way uh, to uh, put them on that is uh, that the uh, University of Nebraska uses. But the point is you wanna make sure that the upper strap is over and placed behind the head towards the crown of the head. 
and the bottom strap is over the top of the head and placed at the knee of the neck below the ear. And you want to make sure that you get a good seal. You want to pinch the, or mold the nose, uh, the nose clip. You don't want to squeeze it tight. You just want to make sure that you've generated a good seal because the tighter that sucker is, beyond the point that it needs to be uh, tightened up, will cause you discomfort while you're in the mask. And you may not notice it right away, but you will notice it after a period of time. And this is where, if uh, we have to go to a surgical mask, this is the uh, part of the procedure where it will be placed. Once it's on, don't adjust it. Because once you have a seal, number one, you're going to, you might break the seal, but number two, your hand might be infected and now you're mucking around with your face and you don't want that to happen either. Place your face shield or goggles on at this particular point in time. Make sure it's snug and comfortable and where you want it before you go in the patient's room because again, you don't want to dose, you don't want to adjust it while it's in there. Because again, if your hands are infected, now you are playing around with your face and you run the risk of transmitting the COVID-19 that might be on your glove to uh, your face. Don your gloves and uh, our gowns are designed so that there is actually a little thumb that you can put it in. Make sure that, that uh, the uh, cuff of the gown comes up and it'll be around the hand and then our gloves will go over and there should be plenty of room in there uh, in terms of um, a crossover with the, uh, the coverage. This is a potential gap. So the best thing I can say is when we put the, uh, the non-sterile gloves on those little yellow gowns we have, make sure when you put them through, you tuck your thumbs in and that'll keep it up uh, far enough to where your glove has plenty of room to cover over the cuff of the other gown. Now, any questions? Well, obviously be coming to your areas to practice this because um, it's nice to look at a slide, but if you've never done this before, you're gonna need to uh, sort of practice it a couple of times, and we do have uh, enough equipment to do that. And if there's any hands-on that needs to go, that needs to be done in a particular area, uh, Jonathan Johnson and I are gonna try and make sure we make it out to all the C-box and get those areas covered also. Now, when you're getting ready to take off the PPE, one thing that everybody seems to forget is clean your hands. Clean your hands. If they're soiled, you need to clean them with soap and water then proceed with an alcohol-based hand rub or just start with the alcohol-based hand rub because if they are still dirty, you are now taking this stuff off your body. And if it's on your hands and you've removed the PPE but you still have dirty gloves, the point of the PPE has just gone out the window. So the first thing you wanna do is sterilize your gloves. Um, double check the gown that before you take it off, make sure the work knee breaks, make sure that um, there wasn't anything that might have been compromised on the gown. And then essentially what you want to do is you're going to untie the ties uh, and then sort of take the gown off in a way that sort of brings it inside out and kind of rolled up into a ball. And you still have your gloves on and then what you're going to do is dispose of the, uh, dispose of the gown then. Next step um, is to remove the gloves. But what I would say is after you touch the gown, do uh, uh, clean your hands first before you go to take your gloves off because again you just touched the gown so sterilize your hands again with the alcohol based hand rub and if it seems like we're going overboard with this as we said before um, we want we don't really know how much the transmission of COVID-19 is and I'll say if it's if the transmission is very similar to the quote-unquote common cold form of coronavirus we all get the common cold it's very easy to transmit and we are playing it safe here I'd rather overdo it than underdo it. So with the gloves, they there's the glove and glove technique, which essentially means sort of tuck your fingers under, make a tab here, bring this glove off right there and sort of roll it inside out and then hold it in the palm of your other hand with your other fingers, tuck it under. And again, like you did with the gown, basically roll it inside out so that the inside of the glove is present and you're holding on to it. At that point, I would probably not ball it up, hold it in your fingers. And after you take your gloves off, perform hand hygiene again. Kind of see the, the sequence that's happening here. Whenever you take something off, do hand hygiene. Then you're gonna to wanna to take your mask off. And again, don't take your mask or your PPE off like this. What they discovered in 2014 was some of the nurses that uh, contracted Ebola. They think what might've happened is when they took their PPE off, they took it off like this and that just brought the Ebola up. It's not confirmed, but it is one of the things that I think might have happened. So what you want to do is you want to take it off like this. Now, again, if something, if you were splashed on your face shield or things like that, do not take the face shield off without gloves. If you have to, get another pair of gloves on, sterilize your hands, and then take it off if you need to. Now you're going to leave the patient care area. The point is, 
The only thing that's on your face as you leave the patient care area is going to be your respirator. That is the last thing that is going to come off. And after you uh, remove the N95 mask, obviously you're going to uh, perform hand hygiene. Um, lean near the waste container outside the room, remove the N95 mask or put it into a paper sack or whatever holding uh, container that we're going to have uh, to try and be able to use the N95 mask through the end of the shift. Um, and then again, it's sort of the sequence. And after you've done that, do the hand hygiene. Then again, this kind of a mechanism for how to take it off. Again, you are leaning over it so that if there's anything on the mask, it's going this direction and not coming up over your head. And again, minimize the contact with the N95 mask because you have it. And then afterwards, again, perform hand hygiene. Now, what about the powered air purifying respirator? Well, there are circumstances where the N95 mask is just not going to be an acceptable um, alternative or an acceptable way of, of, of using, of, of making sure that you're wearing a respirator. If the N95 respirator choice does not fit, uh, you have the employee has some sort of facial hair or other facial deformity that would interfere with you being able to form a good mask to face seal. We don't have an N95 respirators available or we've limited them uh, based on saving them for the high-risk procedures, um, or again, we're doing a, a high-risk aerosol-generating procedure. Before you get into a powered air purified respirator, you have got to be medically cleared. It is mandatory per OSHA that before you put this kind of a respirator on, you are medically cleared because this is a step up in terms of requiring medical clearance uh, than it is from the N95 mask. Typically, it doesn't require fit testing, kind of depends on the model. We are not using ones that, that need fit testing. Um, essentially, what an N95 mask, or I'm sorry, not an N95 mask, a powered air purified respirator involves is some sort of a battery. You're gonna have a blower unit. You're gonna have some sort of a mechanism to check the flow, and you're gonna have a hose, and you're going to have the mask itself up there. It uses a blower to pull air in through uh, one or more HEPA filters. HEPA filters, uh, the HE denotes high efficiency. They're about a thousand times more um, effective at uh, sort of filtering out particles than an N95 mask is. That it's gonna pull the air in through those filters up the hose and sort of by positive pressure, sort of blow it out your face and sort of out the mask. So you will not be bringing in anything from the outside. You will be breathing in clean air that has been filtered through the, uh, the battery operated uh, uh, blower and filter. It's, a true, it's not a true positive pressure device because you can't over breathe uh, the pressure when inhaling. And again, you don't need a face shield because theoretically, this is your face shield sort of built in already. Some of the disadvantages of the powered air purified respirator are it does not supply oxygen. Again, this is not an oxygen or air supplying apparatus. It does require medical clearance to use requires ongoing training to dawn, use safely, and then take off. It can not usually be used with a stethoscope, but some models allow for this, and our um, PAPRs actually allow for the use of a stethoscope, which is one of the reasons why we chose the model that we chose. Um, it can cause claustrophobia. Now, this is a very important thing. Why you are medically cleared is that you're putting on something that is basically going to enclose your entire face and, and sort of isolate it from the outside world. That is the point of a PAPR. I have people during our decontamination class that do just fine, they get the Tyvek shoot up, the minute they go hoods up, they just don't like being in there. The point of this is that if you at any particular time feel unsafe being in the PAPR, I don't want you in the PAPR. If you are not medically able per whoever is screening you to go into a PAPR, you're not gonna go into a PAPR. I've had people that have wanted to use one during the decan class, in some of the outside hospitals that I've helped evaluate, I have had people, uh, healthcare workers, firefighters who want to get in the PAPR gear, and I've said, no, it's not medically safe for you to get in there. Or again, they get in there and something happens and they don't like being in there. If this happens, you get out immediately and you're probably not qualified to wear a PAPR at that point until the situation's either corrected or um, uh, you're able to, for whatever mechanism, to wear a different type of respirator, in this case, an N95 mask. Again, there is limited availability, it relies upon batteries and filters, and we obviously don't have anywhere near the number of powers we have compared to N95 masks. So if you can wear an N95 mask, that is what we want you to start with. All right, so the first thing you're gonna do is you're going to inspect the unit. 
In our particular case, here's what our pappers look like. They are plugged in to the wall and charging at all times. The little wall unit will have a light on there. It'll either be uh, solid green, which means it's fully charged. It'll blink green, which essentially means you are reaching fully charged. If it's red, it means you got a little bit more charge that has to uh, be placed into it. The reason for you to inspect your papper is because you are the one that's getting ready to wear this. If you don't like the way it is, if you think that the hose itself might have a hole in it, or the mask in any size, shape, or form has been compromised, sorry about that, then you don't wear it. If you don't feel comfortable wearing the equipment you're wearing, you're not gonna wear it. I come from an airborne family and you never let somebody else pack your parachute. Probably just the, the same basic reason. Straps, that will basically take it around the waist. And there's gonna be another video that's gonna kind of show how to do this. You're gonna lock it in, you want it on the back. Before you go any further with this, Check all the attachments, make sure the hose sort of screws in, make sure that you have your filter cartridges on there, make sure that your filter cartridges are not expired um, and that the caps are off before you go hood up. This may seem like a really elementary thing to do, but we, during the class, we invariably have somebody that will put their hood on and they haven't taken the caps off. And I don't like to remind them because I wanna see if they uh, forget. Once they're opened, we have probably about 30 days on these particular NIOSH approved HEPA filters. I would say that if we're using the papper sort of continually, we might want to consider changing them a little bit earlier. Obviously, if they get wet or dirty, we're going to get rid of them. Or at any particular point in time, we just don't think the filters are, are doing what they need to do. Battery, you can hear when you reach about 30, 30 minutes of, excuse me, battery life left, it's going to beep. When you reach about five minutes of uh, battery time left, it's going to, you're gonna get a continuous sound coming from it. And beep. I am not comfortable enough that that five minutes is actually five minutes. So what I would recommend is if we start hearing the beep, um, try and uh, wrap up what you're doing if you're able to, knowing that I don't know how much time you're actually going to have and whether it is 30 minutes. And, and if you're doing something, that 30 minutes will actually go a lot quicker. Again, there's going to be another video when we do this again but essentially this is your component the flow meter there's a red a black line there and what you want is the little ball or in this particular case little black uh, thing to kind of go up above that black line and what that indicates is you have enough flow being pulled in through the filters and then up the hose and around your face if it doesn't go up to that black line we need to go recharge the battery if it doesn't come on at all and you know it's, you, it says it's fully charged, we need to not use this paper. So when you're putting it on, pull the face piece over the head, check the seals, your ears will be open. And again, just take a look at the training video that we have. Remove the paper if, while you're in it, breathing becomes difficult. Again, I know what it's like during a training exercise to be laid on your air hose and you will quickly start to sweat. You will quickly be breathing what is inside your mask, the air that's in there because you got no air coming and you got these little itty bitty holes where the air exits that you're trying to breathe through that are now cramped against your face. If breathing becomes difficult at any time, I want you out of there. And it may not even necessarily be the mask, it may be you and whatever medical condition you might have or might have developed could just be anxiety or dizziness, you need to get out of the paper as quickly as possible. Um, the eyes and nose or mouth might become irritated. Again, it depends on what else might be in the room and or whether or not you have sort of a break um, in the mask. You want to remove the paper only when outside the isolation room. Because again, this is your respirator. Remove it, the paper in the same spot of the sequence where you would remove the N95 mask outside the room. Gloves do remain on feel like you have to, you can put another set of gloves on. What we're going to try and do is clean the outside of the papper with some sort of a uh, disinfecting a solution. We're thinking about something we can spray on there. Um, the uh, purple wipes seem to destroy that face mask on there, so we're recommending not using those. And obviously you're going to have an assistant in gloves that's going to help you remove the papper and place it over to where uh, it can be um, used again if necessary. If a papper is used on a patient in the emergency room, that papper is gonna follow the patient throughout the hospitalization. And again, you wanna make sure after you've taken the papper off, you have done good hand hygiene. 
One of the things I also recommend is uh, whenever anybody's in a papper or during my decon class when they're in the huge Tyvek suit and they have the hood that's coming over, I like people to be in pairs. You know, if they go into the area arm in arm and the point is that person is to watch the other person while they're in the papper. What I recommend is if we have someone in a papper that we either have somebody else in a papper in the room with them or uh, say in our intensive care units where we have the glass door, someone is keeping an eye on the person with the papper because while it may seem very safe, the work of activity is going to dramatically go up the longer you're in these. You're in gowns and gloves, you're not being allowed to sweat, and now you have something completely enclosing your face. And even if it's cold weather outside, I tell my decon team, you can rapidly become hot in these things. Now, while this is not a large Tyvek suit with a hooded papper, it still can become very, uh, very cramped in there and you can become hot very quickly. And we always want to make sure that somebody is under constant observation if possible while they're wearing the papper. If, again, we were able to do that. All right, if there are any questions, um, please let me know.